and be with us, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God has many desires, but one of the desires He has for you and for me is something I'm going to reveal to you. Paul, the great evangelist and apostle Paul, understood this desire. And in his letter to the Philippi, he said this in regards to his desire, and he said that I may know Him. Now, who's him here? It's Jesus, God, okay? Paul's desire was that he said, I want to know God. Look at this theme we see here quickly. If you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul desired to know God, and he desired for God's people to also know him, capital H. And look at this in Colossians. Colossians is in the New Testament, and it is after you pass the the Timothy. um, No, I'm sorry. It's yeah after the Corinthians, you come to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then you come to Colossians. And just say Amen when you get there. And then we're going to go to Second Peter. But we're in Colossians chapter 1, and look at what Paul begins to tell God's people. Colossians 1, verse 10. Which chapter? What verse? 10. It says, Now look, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here Paul says that I desire, and God's desire is for you to increase in the knowledge of God. In other words, that you may know Him better. Go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, go, continue to go to the right. After the Hebrews and James, you come to the Peters. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, and look at how Peter ends his epistle to God's people. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Are you there? But grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. That his desire is for his, God's people to grow in grace and, again, in the knowledge to know God and Jesus. To him be the glory both now and forever. And the church said, amen. Here we have Paul. He says, I, I desire to know him. Then he tells the, 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 uh, the church in, there in Colossians that you may know God. Peter says that you may grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, who is God. Look at this. Go to the the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 5. So you're going to go to the right again. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And look at how the apostle here, John, in his epistle, ends what he says. Look at this. Are you in 1 John chapter 5? Look at verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may, ah, that we may know Him who is true. Who is who? True. And we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The true God is Christ. Amen. He is the true God. He, we have God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But God here, the true God, Jesus Christ, that you may know Him. Paul says, I want to know Him. Paul desires that you grow in the knowledge of God. Peter says that you may know and grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. John says that we may know Him. Now go to the Gospel of John and look what Jesus says. God desires for us to know Him. Go to John chapter 14. Look what Jesus says. 
John 14, verse 7, and then we're going to go to chapter 17. But right now, John chapter 14, verse 7, look what Jesus says. Say amen if you're there. It says, if you had, what? Known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Does Jesus want us to know him? And God, of course, right? Now look at chapter 17, chapter 17, verse 3. And when Christ is praying to the Father, He says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only, there it is again, true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, God desires for you and I to know Him because God desires to see you in eternity. Because to know Him is to love Him. And to love Him is to surrender your will to Him and accept the free gift of salvation that He has given us. He wants you to prosper and He wants to truly, you to truly know Him and he wants you to know this, that, to, to have, that life is better with Jesus than without Jesus. Amen. And he also wants you to understand that true peace, true happiness, true fulfillment, true joy, true excitement, true satisfaction comes from knowing him and how he views you. Now, God desires the world to know him, yes or no? Yes. Now, look what we're about to see here. Could God, and for the world to know him, could God just appear to humanity in all his glory? Yes or no? Could God, the Almighty, just appear to sinful man and we behold his holiness. Could God just do that? He, we're going to see, had to veil himself for us to truly know him. He had to do what? In Desire of Ages, page 23, we're told, had he appeared we could not have endured the light of his presence. You see, that's why at the second coming, before Christ can come in all his glory, he has to seal a people ready for that event. Amen. So he must veil himself and listen now. Did you know that God, Jesus, had shadowed forth types and symbols through his dealings with mankind to reveal this great truth that would come to pass of his divinity veiled in humanity. Let me give you some examples. You see, he could not just appear to Moses in all his splendid glory. He had to use a, a bush to sort of veil himself to speak to Moses. Did you know this? Now, listen carefully. It's not on the screen, but I'm reading now from Desire of Ages, page 23. The burning bush in which Christ appeared to Moses revealed God, the symbol chosen for the representation of the deity was a lowly shrub that seemingly had no attractions. Now, listen to this. This enshrined the infinite, the all-merciful God shrouded his glory in a most humble type that Moses could look upon it and live. So he veiled his, his glory in this bush and the humility it takes for God to to do this, just to connect with Moses, he did. Can you say amen? That wasn't all. We saw these types and symbols in regards to the cloud by day and the fire by night. 
Again, Desire of Ages, page 23, she says, So in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, God communicated with Israel, revealing to men His will and imparting to them His grace. Now listen. God's glory was subdued and His majesty veiled that the weak vision of finite men might behold it. These were types and symbols of God eventually coming to veil Himself and reveal Himself through Christ. Just stay with me here. For Jesus, for God to communicate with man, He could not just appear in all His glory. We'd be completely, of course, devoured. So He he humbles Himself and veils Himself to communicate with man that we might know Him. Now look at this. Of course, the greatest of this showing, all these veilings that that were types and symbols foreshadowed the greatest of all veilings for the love of mankind. Guess, uh, and then he did a sanctuary, but guess what that was, is when he was incarnated as a man. Now, let me just say this right off the bat, that the incarnation is a mystery. Let's not confuse that. Did you know that you and I in our little finite brains cannot comprehend the incarnation of God, the Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, coming as a little baby and veiling and putting divinity aside, becoming a man and walking and talking and going. You and I cannot comprehend this kind of love that he has, this kind of humility that he has, and how this worked. Here you see in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 246, the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ in human flesh is a mystery. Amen? We accept it and believe it because God's Word reveals it. And we have no business to think that we could try to... It is a mystery that that all God of the universe would come into human flesh. Now, look at this. This is incredible. In the Old Testament, prophecies where the Messiah would be born. Did you know that in the Old Testament, it actually said what city the Messiah would be born? Did you guys know that? We usually, I'm going to, we usually read that verse in Micah, we're going to go to it in a minute. Usually we look and read that verse and just focus, just focus on the place he would be born. But let's go to Micah 5.2 and let's not miss the last portion of that prophecy. Micah, in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. I'll give you a second to get there. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. This mystery of the God of the universe veiling himself in human flesh. Look at this. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Say amen if you're there. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 it says. But you, which town? Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, capital O, capital R. Right? Is this a prophecy of the coming Messiah, yes or no? Where would he be born? And we usually close our Bibles and say, well, that's wonderful, but don't miss the last sentence. Look at it carefully. Are you still there? Look at this. Whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Did you get it? Yes or no? What is it saying? Who is from everlasting? What had Micah prophesied? Not only that he would be born in Bethlehem, but that the one that would be born was God. Do you see it? Yes or no? God in the what? The flesh. 
And of course, John, in John 1, reveals this truth. Go to John 1 quickly. Of course, John picks up on this, and you might even know the verses, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes? And now verse 14 tells us what Micah had told us. And the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Could God just appear in all His holiness for us to receive His glory, yes or no? No. He veils Himself now in the most humblest, incredible way in the incarnation. It's a mystery, but it's true. Micah had said He'll be born in Bethlehem, but this is not just, this is God Himself in the flesh. And John picks up on it and says, yes, the Word becomes flesh, and we see Him so we can know Him. Now look, go to Isaiah. Go to the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, just stay with me. Isaiah chapter 7. God longs for you to know Him. And He would do all He can, not only to save you, but for you to know who He is. Are you in Isaiah chapter 7? Look at what Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. What does the name Emmanuel mean? God with us. Isn't that what Micah said, yes or no? And guess who, of course, unpacks that in Matthew chapter 1. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Let's see who can beat me there. I was already there. Matthew 1, verse 20. And it says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, here we go, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, Matthew says, God with us. So here we see again that the Bible was crystal, crystal clear that this little baby that was born through Mary there and then eventually became a man was not just any ordinary man, not just a prophet. He is God in the flesh. Mystery. And he has to do this because if he would come in all his glory, could we behold him, yes or no? Therefore, for him to get us to know him, he humbles himself and becomes this man, and we're going to get deeper into this, that therefore we can behold him and know him, because to know him is to love him. Now, in Desire of Ages, she says, had he appeared with the glory that was with his, was his with the Father, she does not say that he is the Father, she says, was with the Father. Before the world was, we could not have endured the light of His presence, that we might behold it and not be what? Destroyed. You see, friends, she continues, the manifestation of His glory was shrouded. What was it? Shrouded. Look at this. His divinity was veiled with humanity the invisible glory in the visible human form. 
You see, and this is where our friends, our Muslim friends, can't comprehend. They can't comprehend, they can't comprehend that Jesus is also God because Jesus was a man. And they cannot connect the two to say if he's a man, he can't be God. And that's what, of course, they come to their conclusions in what they read in the Quran. You see, they teach that Jesus can't be God because he was a man. But listen now, they fail to understand and to truly know the true God and his love and humility that, yes, God could and did veil himself in such a way that it was God in the flesh. They can't comprehend that, but you see, the Bible clearly teaches it, God is love. Amen. I love what E.J. Wagner says. Listen to what he says. E.J. Wagner, Signs of the Times, October 21st. He says, it is impossible for us to understand how this could be, talking about the incarnation, and it is worse than useless for us to speculate about it. Now look what he says. All we can do is to accept the facts as they are presented in the Bible. It's true. God in the flesh veiled himself in such a way that we could know him. In selected messages, we're told, what a sight. Now, please, open your hearts to how awesome God is. What a sight was this for heaven to look upon. Christ, who knew not the least taint of sin or defilement, and look what she says, took our nature in its deteriorated condition. It's enough for God to come in the condition before, as a man before sin entered, but she makes it crystal clear that he took our post-sinful condition. That after 4,000 years of sin and deterioration, Christ now becomes a man. If humbling himself enough, again, being a man before sin wasn't like, whoa, now after sin, he comes. This was humiliation, look at this, greater than finite man can comprehend. Do you know that for all eternity, we're going to be studying the love of Jesus, the love of God? You and I cannot comprehend this type of humility and love. You can't do it. She continues, God was manifest in the flesh. He humbled himself. What a subject for thought, for deep, earnest contemplation. This sentence here is what compelled me for this message. What a thought, what contemplation can this be that the God of heaven would come as a man, and not just a man, but after 4,000 years of sinful uh, in the world. So infinitely great that he was the majesty of heaven, and yet he stooped so what? So low. Without losing one atom of his dignity and glory, he stooped to poverty and to the deepest abasement among men. Look at this. For our sake. Why did he do all this? Why why did he do all this? For us. For you. Why why did he come and veil himself that the creator of the universe would come and stoop himself to be born as a little baby after 4,000 years of already sitting in the world to be a man, be tempted for you, for me? Look at this. For our sake, he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. 
I told my class today that you, you do know that if you become a child of the king, that makes you royalty. Did you know that? Did you know that we are going to be, be uh, Christ is going to be placed crowns on our heads after he comes? Did you know that? And guess what? Only royalty wears crowns. That God would take the lowliest of sinners and put them in a place where they are royalty and his children. And that he would think it to humble himself and veil himself in human flesh. I wish our, our Muslim friends and others would understand this great truth to worship the true God to say, wow, this is incredible. And he did that for me. Go to Philippians 2. We're almost done. Paul expounds on this humility of God. Philippians chapter 2, you might know these verses. Never gets old. Philippians. Say amen when you get there. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, and Paul here again writing to the church in Philippi. God wants us to know him. Open your hearts to who God is. Here we go. Let this mind be, I'm in verse 5, chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And again, not before Adam uh, sinned, but after deterioration of 4,000 years. Hello. Verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in the glory of God the Father. In Christ and his righteousness, E.J. Wagner said here on page 25, don't you miss it, he could not enjoy his glory while man was an outcast without hope. So he emptied himself. Divested himself of all his riches and his glory and took upon himself the nature of man in order that he might redeem him. You see, God could not sit up there and allow us to suffer. He says, no, I can't, I can't, I can't live eternity this way. I can't, I can't live eternity with my children suffering. I have to come and leave everything to save them. And this truth here reveals really in regards to hellfire, friends. How can God allow people to burn for all eternity and yet be okay with it? Just the understanding of him coming to save mankind from eternal death should wipe out this demonic doctrine of hell, e conscious eternal hellfire. It's false. He could not enjoy his glory while man was an outcast without hope. I agree with what Wagner said. Anybody else? So my last few things here. So when God comes and as a little baby to save man. How did the heavenly beings react to this? Go to Luke quickly. How did the heavenly beings react to this? Go to Luke chapter 2 quickly as we come to a close. Luke chapter 2.
Same moment you get there. How did the angels describe the birth of Jesus? How did the heavenly angels describe what happened here? So we're in Luke chapter 2, and it says in verse 8, if I can ever get there. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Who's them here? The shepherds. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Who's them? Okay. And they were greatly afraid. Verse 10. Then the angel said to them, here it is, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings of what kind of joy? Yeah, not just great joy, he says, the angel said, which will be to how many people? All people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And as the Bible teaches that Christ came to save the world, that salvation again is available to every person that's ever lived if you accept it in Christ. And he says this is great joy. Why? Because a Savior is born. God, somebody once said, God hasn't done anything for me, and they were complaining. God hasn't done anything for me. God, and, and I was thinking to myself, God hasn't done anything for you? Maybe not the way that you want him. To, maybe he's not the magic genie that you want to, Lord, I have three wishes. God hasn't done anything for you? He's done everything. To say that God has done nothing for me is a selfish, selfish sentence. And my last point is that in the process of God doing all this was that then he could also understand us in our trials. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And as a man, he's tempted. And therefore, anything that you and I can go through, God understands. He understands what it means to be tempted. He understands what it means to go hungry. He understands what it means to, to many things. And hallelujah, though, yet he was without sin. Can you say amen? But he understands. What does that tell you? That you can just go to Jesus and say, Lord, I know you understand what I'm going through. There is nothing that you can hide from God. He understands everything. Just go to Jesus. There is nothing that you are going through that God cannot understand. And he says, I understand. Just go to Jesus. My last quote here, Desire of Ages, page 24. Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and sympathizes with our griefs. Are you sitting down? Every son and daughter of Adam Who's that? Who were your quote unquote first parents? Adam and Eve. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. And those amens were weak. You didn't get it. That our Creator is a, the friend of sinners. And he humbled himself in the most incredible way. To avail himself so we can know him. And I pray that we will understand what great joy and good tidings that is. And God has done all this for you. I pray that as we are in this season of remembering the incarnation, that we can truly grasp 
what God did to be here to save us. This is serious business. So God desires for you to know him so you can love him. Paul says, I know him. To Colossians, he said that you may grow in the knowledge of God. Peter says, as he ends his epistle, that you can grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, God. First John, he says that you may know him. Jesus says that they may know me and you, Father, who sent me, that they may have everlasting life. Do you desire to know God? Do you desire to know the true God of the Bible? I might not be able to truly comprehend or really describe how it works, but praise the Lord that it's true, that the incarnation of Christ is true, and he loves you more than anything in the world. So if your desire to say, Lord, I desire to know you more than anything in the world, I ask you to raise your hand here today. That's me. That's me. That's me. Amen. Father God, thank you so much for being with us, Lord. You want us to know you. And Lord, I believe that the thing that we need to be the most excited over is who you are. And Lord, I'm thankful that you had to, that you veiled yourself so we could know you, Lord, because obviously a holy God among sinful people just would not work. But Lord, we're also thankful that one day you will come as you are. And thank you for preparing us for that day. But Lord, I pray that we can truly truly know you and just accept what the Bible teaches in regards to your incarnation, your veiling of yourself, Lord, in human flesh to save us. This is really what Christmas is all about is understanding who you are and celebrating your love and humility to save us. That is the point of Christmas. Amen. So Lord, help us know you. Help us be excited for who you are, Lord. And may we share with others, Lord, this beautiful truth Be with your people and use them for your glory. I want to pray for the, 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 the younger kids and the older kids and the, those that, Lord, help them truly understand who you are in their hearts. That life with Jesus is way far off better than life without Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, let all his people say, Amen.